Sue Mondello, welcome to Cancer Choices and the New School at Commonweal. Thank you, Michael. Let's just go into quiet together the way we often do at the beginning of our conversation. Peace, peace. Peace, peace. So, as you know, in our healing circles work, uh, we always start any circle with a, a check-in with everyone who's on the circle and the healing circles global.org global community. Um, and so uh, I always do that with every call I'm on. Um, and especially with you this morning. So let's both start with check-ins. So my question would be simply, um, how does this day find you? I'd say like many days, it finds me with gratitude. I'm staring out at an incredible blue sky. Hmm. It's probably in the 30s, so it's a brisk day. I have the gift of this sunroom that is not uh it's a three seasons room so i just crank up my own heaters and make it a lovely little hollow for myself so i'm grateful that we are in this room together mm. um i'm ecstatic with the opportunity just to spend some time with you uh it's always a gift for me when you and i get one-on-one -on -one time mm. i um i feel like it's the best opening of a gift every single time so um I'm good. Glad to be here. And I'm grateful to see you and looking forward to the next moments that we share together. Absolutely. And as for me, I find myself, let me put it this way, as well as I know how to be. Um, it's been a challenging period of time in our household. Um, uh, my wife, Charles and I uh, lost her beloved canine companion, Rafi, uh, just a little over a month ago. And this just absolutely devastated Charles. I mean, completely. Um, I have since learned, and I sort of knew it already, but there are studies that show that the loss of a, a dog or cat, you know, animal companion can absolutely be as devastating as the loss of a sister or a parent or even a spouse um, and or perhaps a child. Um, and so uh, I knew that theoretically, but I didn't know what it was like to live with it. Um, so, um, and then a month after Rafi died, about uh, three or four days ago, uh, we uh, acquired a new puppy, Francis, spelled with an I, although she's a female. I, I call her Saint, Saint Francis. <laughs> Uh, because of her incredible healing power. And we're just completely in love with her. And uh, that's fabulous. But in this moment, with the change of diet, uh, Frances is, who was well trained, but she's pooping on the floor uh, because she has. Uh, the change of diet has affected her. And so uh, we're navigating, um, you know, that and at the same time falling in love with her. And I think the final thing I'll say about it is uh, what it surfaces is different approaches to puppy rearing, just like child rearing. And so when if you're a single person with a puppy or a cat, you get to make the calls. But if there are two of you, you have to navigate <clears throat> how 
to raise the puppy. So I have surrendered to Cheryl's way of raising the puppy and surrendered everything about it. And the puppy is completely in love with Cheryl and resists a bit when I try to take her on walks, keeps looking back to see if Cheryl is following. So we're in the midst of uh, puppy adaptation. Um, and it feels a little bit with all the other things happening in life, like full catastrophe living, John Kabat-Zinn's phrase from Zorba the Greek. So anyway, that's how I am. Uh, various other human experiences, but I thought I'd start by my truth today. Well, welcome, St. Francis. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Sue, um, we were just saying before uh, we began recording this conversation that um, well, we met in the Commonweal Cancer Help Program, and I, I remember we walked out to Jennifer Stoll's chapel together, a little wooden shack at the edge of the Pacific uh, where yeah. people leave stones and messages to their beloved ones who have passed on. And you spoke of just this intense heart feeling that you belonged at Commonweal. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you and I just shared this experience. You said before we began recording that you felt you'd known me all your life, and I feel the same about you. So we start from this heart place together of mutual recognition. We explored having you work with us on cancer choices and we're really thrilled about the idea and then life intervened right so yeah. tell us um tell us about where you find yourself with your cancer diagnosis mm -hmm. wow um just when I feel like I can't hit a, a new plateau, I feel like I've hit a new plateau. I entered hospice um, a couple weeks ago, and the intention of many intentions of hospice is to provide symptom relief and pain relief and to keep the patient as comfortable as possible. I often forget that my world is cancer. So when I'm talking with the practitioners, they have other reasons why people are in hospice. It could be from Alzheimer's or um, end-stage renal disease. It could be a myriad of, so my head always seems to be in cancer. Most recently, my symptoms have been edema and lymphedema, and there are different types of edema. Um, the edema that cause, is caused from the vascular system and then the edema from the lymph and much like when you're diagnosed with cancer, people will say, Oh, I've had that symptom and I did this and it helped me and it went away. Or, Oh, I have an uncle who has that and they did this and it went away. Or, um, so it's another one of those symptoms that people have several people who have experience with it. The challenge for, in my circumstance, is um, the tumors are sitting in a very precarious place, which means they are blocking my lymph nodes um, and therefore the flow down my leg. And they are compromising my organs and compromising my bowels. Mm -hmm. And this is all happening on the right side of my body. Hmm. And I swear, I don't know where I get it, but I'm that, I've ever seen that weeble wobble that can't fall down. I just bounce back up again. And sometimes it astounds me that I'm able to do it. Um, more recently, I've had dialogues with hospice and my oncologist because there's this gray area I've since discovered where when you're in the medical system diagnosed with cancer at whatever stage and, and, and 
you may be in palliative before you had hospice, you still qualify for tests and certain treatment regimens. When you fall into hospice, you no longer qualify and it's just all pain management and comfort. So apparently there is a tool that is available, but um, hospice, it doesn't fall under their bailiwick and it doesn't exactly fall under medical care at this point. So it falls into this gray zone. And I feel like a lot of my cancer journey, I have fallen into the gray zone. And I don't know if a lot of patients feel that way or if they just don't know that they're falling into the gray zone and therefore they just accept the treatment protocol that they've been given. And why I bring this up is I'm pretty well read and I've read a tremendous amount on lymphedema and it is actually called cancer's dirty little secret that is way more prevalent, way less diagnosed and even less treated. And so in trying to be my own advocate, there are a lot of circular conversations because many people don't know the scope of how to manage edema, let alone lymphedema. And because it is the little, little dark secret, no one wants to take ownership of it. So I've had a week of frustration in wanting someone to stand up and own it and everyone point the finger and send me down a hallway that leads me down another hallway that leads me back to the beginning hallway where I was. So how am I doing with my cancer? Well, before you go on there, I don't want to miss this point because it's relevant. I heard you say that there is a tool, there is something that could be done if you were still in palliative care with the reimbursement that works there, but uh, does not work in hospice. And now is that, did I get that right? Correct. So I would assume that you're aware, I don't know how it works where you live, but I know that um, one truth, because this is this is a classic issue, right? It's like, do you have access to the full set of tools that you had in uh, conventional curative care or palliative care? Then you move into hospice where the reimbursement system is such that they can't afford because they're a capitated system to give you this access. So what many patients do is to move in and out of hospice and palliative care. So they'll be in hospice, and then they'll step out of hospice, go back into palliative care to get the treatment they need, and then move back into hospice again. So my question is, do people do that where you are, or are there, is it worth, as they say, is the juice worth the squeeze, you know, right. to do that, or is that practical where you are, or have you considered it? Great questions. Um, yes, I do know of people who do that. I don't know if we're to that point yet. And the reason why I say that is when I asked the representative, fortunately, I have a tremendous healthcare background from many directions. And, and, and why I, that has served me is I have worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I've worked in the biotech industry. I've worked with hospitals, I've worked with payers, I've worked with technology companies, I've worked in management consulting. And so oftentimes what an, it's enabled me to do is take a singular topic, but then be able to have a dialogue from the different perspectives because everyone comes to the table with their own agenda. So having said that, when I spoke with the rep who sells the product, he said, well, actually, you can be on hospice and insurance will pay for this. And that's when my ears perked. What I'm learning is there's a protocol you have to go through in terms of do you qualify? So we're at the beginning stages of do I qualify for 
the technology. But the step before that is the assessment to see what is the status of my cancer and will the protocol will this tool do more harm than good because of the progression of the cancer? Am I still in a window where that tool can help me or have I fallen outside of the window regardless of who reimburse and whether I'm in conventional or hospice? And so it involves a tremendous amount of phone calls and people will say, well, a social worker can help navigate this for you. From my experience, um, social workers are great at giving phone numbers to call, but they're not very good at laying out the path and help actually helping you navigate. That has been something my entire four years of cancer that I have had to learn how to do, which again, I'm grateful because of my background and my education and my experience that I know how to do that. But I can see how many people are falling through the system who are way underserved, who wouldn't even know where to begin and will not make it. Even if they qualify, they will not make it because the system is very convoluted and there are near, no clear paths. And then someone can argue the point that we're all bio individuals, so it depends on the person to person, but there ought to at least be step A, begin here, step B, step C, step C. Instead, it's kind of pixie sticks and you kind of put the red pixie sticks together and the blue ones together and then you see if, okay, if a yellow one mixes in with it, it's, 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 it's a mess. And so what I find myself doing when I come upon situations that are this um, disjointed is I get angry at first and then I stand back and then I roll up my sleeves and I start digging in. And it's how I'm built. Um, I know one path I could take would be to do nothing. And hospice would then continue to give me drugs until I pass. Um, I, know that's a, I know that's a path. I don't know if all hospice patients are aware that that's, that's the path. I think they believe they just need to listen to the hospice providers and that's their that's the path they're given but that is a path that's not the only path so i know that if i engage my oncologist i've already sent him about 3 pages of research that i've done i've engaged the company that has the technology i've started engaging um there are lymphatic specialists. So where do I sit in the lymphatic specialist spectrum to even know which modality would fit? Because some people can do well just with simple stretching and yoga, and some people will need stints. I'm past the point. My doctor said there's no way a stint will help me, but would this quote unquote technology help me? I don't know yet. So it's a new journey of beginning to identify, is this a viable path for me? And the hours that will go into doing this is astounding, absolutely astounding. And I am doing this as my own advocate. I don't have anybody else doing this for me. And quite frankly, some days it just gets exhausting because I did this with my chemo. I did this with my immunotherapy. I did this with each of the different um, protocols that we looked at to identify, is this the best protocol for me? And quite frankly, it's why I'm still here. I would have passed sooner had I not done all that work. But some days you kick the tires and the tires feel a little tired. Um, but it's our system. And... It's Can what I know. What, what the technology is that might help you? What's it called? I believe it's called FlexiCare. It's Flexi. Um, what does it do? My understanding, um, and I, when I spoke to the rep, he had offered to give me a demo. 
our heart is a natural pump for our um, blood vessels. Our lymph does not have that natural pump. And I believe what this is, is it's a, it's a piece of material that goes over your arm or your leg. And by the way, when I did my research, up to 83% of breast cancer patients are impacted by lymphedema and up to 50% of endometrial cancer patients are affected up, uh, by lymphedema. And I believe over 10 million Americans uh, cancer patients are affected by lymphedema. So there's a large number of us. What this tool actually does, I have not seen a demo, so I'm not 100% clear. And I don't know if it would be adjusted based on disease. Would, it, would a lung cancer patient or someone who had their lymph removed have an adjustment? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's an adjustment for the arm for the breast cancer I patient. I I and then it. one for the leg for someone with lymphedema in the legs. Mm -hmm. So I'm still literally in the very early stages of understanding this technology. Beautiful. Thank you. Let's... Um... I do this. Let's just take a moment and go quiet again together and just sort of bring this part of the conversation to a close. Peace, peace. You know, just being with you and listening to you, this is exactly why we so wanted to work with you on cancer choices, uh, because, uh, and you're actually working with us right now, you know. <laughs> We just didn't expect to do it this way, but your incredible background and in, in pharma and every aspect of healthcare from uh, the spiritual, the psychological, nutritional, physical, this is what Cancer Choices is all about. Um, so, um, Lord, I, I'm so sorry that we don't get to do this for a long time together you know yeah, yeah. it is uh, i was saying the other day there are times where you feel like you come into a place and you and you think well this is nice i could i could be here and then you come into a place and you exhale and you you think wow this is where i belong these yeah. are my people and from the moment i started reading your work I devoured it. I was like, I couldn't get enough of it. I, I wanted more and more and more. And your approach and your thoughtfulness and your research and the perspectives, it, it is home to me. It is very much home to me. And I know also part of the reason why I am where I am today is because of Come and Wheel and all of the work you and your team have done. Mm -hmm. It has informed me. It has given me hope it has enlightened me um it's helped keep me alive and for that i'm very grateful hmm. people are so afraid of quiet you know just these pauses and they just this drive to keep talking and jam in as much as you can you know soul doesn't look that way you know soul needs spaciousness you know just space um i want to start at the very beginning this many other things this is a spiritual biography um where were you born and raised i was born and raised in bogota colombia my parents were actually missionaries my father was um working with the United States and Latin America to help build international relations. From that grew many things. Mm -hmm. um, in third and fourth world countries, education is wealth. Mm -hmm. And um, he was involved initially with the University of the Andes. I believe he worked with Fulbrights. Um, he actually formed one of the first strikes in Bogota and Latin America for teachers to learn how to achieve just wages and then was later hired by the Javiana University, which is the Jesuits, and did work with them as well. Um, 
I was too young to know, but he entertained heads of states and heads of countries in terms of how to bring about better education. And um, I actually, we actually moved back to the United States. There are five of us in my family. Uh, we moved back when I was a year and a half because it was becoming dangerous to have American children in the streets. And with five of us, that's a lot to manage. And um, because he was working with the Javiana University, he was offered to come run the international program at St. Louis University. And that's how we ended up here. Um, although both of my parents are originally from Michigan, they are both full-blooded Italian descent. Um, so. so Catholic. Yes. Yeah. So, and so where were you in eighth grade? <laughs> Eighth grade. Great question. That's a fun, I, and I'm, I'm intrigued that you asked that question because I had gone in and out of the Catholic and the public schools. And in eighth grade, I was approached to become commissioner of school spirits. One of the nuns approached me, which meant I oversaw every grade, kindergarten through eighth grade. So whenever there were pep rallies or basketball games or any kind of events, I was the commissioner that rallied everybody. And that meant that the summer before eighth grade, they sent me with about 120 students from across the United States to a leadership training in Notre Dame University. Um, so I have attended leadership training my entire life. And the first one I ever attended was when I was what 12 years old at Notre Dame University. And it was astounding. It was to this day, a life-changing event for me. So I find it very interesting that you asked me where I was in eighth grade. I was cheering on my entire school and I was getting leadership training at Notre Dame University. Mm. My father taught for several years near the end of his life at Notre Dame. Uh, he was a political philosopher named Max Lerner, you know, full-blooded Russian Jew, right? Uh -huh. uh, and actually... He had an advanced cancer at that point, and uh, but he was so committed to being able to do this that he willed his way through two years of teaching with a distinguished professorship at Notre Dame. Uh, so I have a I have a soft spot in my heart, uh, not only for Notre Dame, but I really have a profound soft spot for what I would call the the inner teaching of the living christ that is yeah. to say uh not the bureaucracy not the institutional dimension but the inner truth that has been nourished uh in the catholic tradition uh that goes all the way back and so because you know i sometimes describe myself as a Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, yogic, Sufi with Taoist influences. But I also say that the way spirit comes to me in difficult times uh, is as, as the living Christ. And you and I have talked a little about our shared experience of, of the inner teaching. I mean, I don't distinguish the living Christ from the Buddha or Krishna or, you know, to me, these are, there's, you know, I, I believe, just I choose to believe, I would say that truth is one, paths are many, and that there's a, a light that comes down and fractals out into different traditions of uh, great teachings. But the one, because my mother was a secret Catholic, uh, married this secular Jew, and couldn't teach her children that directly, but she had me smuggled out by a nanny and baptized uh, at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. And she tells me that I fell down in the aisle in front of the uh, altar in prayer at an early age. So, and this all was invisible to me um, until I won't tell the whole story. Uh, but as a senior, as a as a so as a second year student in high school, a, a prep school, I wanted to go to the Catholic 
thing. You know, I didn't know anything about it. Wanted to go to the Catholic Church. I thought it was because there was a 5 a.m. service and I'd have the rest of the day free. <laughs> and my parents said, no, no, you can't do that, which I was outraged by because it wasn't that I thought I had anything about Catholicism, but rather simply that they were interfering with my freedom of choice. But I realized later that it was part of a pattern that over time I came to understand that I found the living Christ most deeply in old stone Catholic churches that had been prayed in for long periods of time. <laughs> and I didn't want to be around uh, masses or anything. I didn't want the only masses I liked being around were the Latin masses. You know, I loved the, the ancient traditions, you know, which is very hard to find. So anyway, just one of the many levels at which we resonate is this level of, yeah. So let me jump from that to, um, so we know you were the, the spirit leader for uh, your whole uh, school in eighth grade. What were you like and where were you as a senior in high school? Before I answer that, I, I want to tag on to something that you mm -hmm. said that is very meaningful. I, I fully agree it's it's the God living within, and mm -hmm. it, it, to me, it doesn't matter if it's what you label it as Buddhist, Christian, because as a child, I was very gifted in two ways. One, we would have potlucks in our house. It comes and, to cat, by the way, and as we say, it's not a webinar until the cat shows up. So what is the cat's name? This is Gigi, and outside is Oliver. Oh, okay. Oliver has this terrible crush on Gigi, oh. and, and Oliver are currently flirting. So, oh. <laughs> little backstory. Um, at some point, Oliver may jump up, and you may see him. He's a beautiful <laughs> tabby, and if you ever watch Leave it to Beaver, he's much like Eddie Haskell. <laughs> you look beautiful today, Mrs. Cleaver, <laughs> and, then, and then he's a terror. Um, but anyway, <laughs> back to yeah, my Do story. they ever get to get together or are they? No, I'm together? afraid oof, it would be hard to pull them apart. So I've, I've not ventured down that path. <laughs> so I like that that unknown tension to exist. <laughs> um yeah, it's, it's, it's the fun. obstructed brook that sings, you know, <laughs> exactly. and, and some of the most beautiful relationships are the unconsummated ones. Because Absolutely. We never get to live with the full catastrophe of the other human being <laughs> exactly. or the other cat, for that matter. <laughs> but the energy is full on. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so back to uh, senior so, in high school. So back before senior in high school, what they used to do is at Christmas, they'd have open houses and we'd have potlucks and we'd have Muslims and Jews and Christians because my parents knew what it was like to live in another country. And they always wanted someone from who was outside of the country who had no family, didn't understand the food to come into a home and to share the food. And that became very instrumental for me throughout my life because my father said to me, you will travel. You will go to other countries and you will get out of your comfort zone. And that has gifted me in ways that my friends are like, can you get your dad to have me go study abroad? My dad came from such a different heart place that I know that influenced my decisions and how I interacted with people the rest of my life. Um, so in eighth grade, I then was graduating. I, um, Let's see, we're going to senior in high school, right? Uh, I mean, sorry, sorry, I'm senior in high school. My father wanted me to go close to home, and I wanted to go far away. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to go to California. And for some reason, he was adamant about me staying close to home. Well, then I kind of understood later why, because my freshman year, he died of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up, um, staying close to my mother, um, being the youngest of five. She actually had just started her master's and her PhD. Um, mm. So here I am, she's in her late 40s and in early 50s, and she's beginning her career. Um, so I had a mother who had a dual career. She was a homemaker and did an incredible job. And then she received a full 
scholarship from Danforth, the Danforth grant to become a psychologist. So I ended up staying closer to home to be around her because my father had been such a support for her. And anyone who's gone through a master's and a PhD knows that it really helps to have a good support system around you. And so I opted to postpone some of my dreams so that I could be closer to her. And it worked out well for both of us. I think I would have taken a different path had that not happened, but it's the path I took and it's the right path. And to this day, my mother and I are extremely close, extremely close. And she's a gift. She's an absolute gift. What's it like for your mom, uh, for you to be uh, in this place? Um, she's got a faith that is, I've, I've never seen anything like it. When I think back when I was, a, all the way back to grade school, when I would come down in the morning, my mother would be sitting in this big wing back chair and she'd be sipping her coffee in the dark and she was meditating and praying before meditating became this thing. That's what I witnessed my entire life was my mother sipping her coffee, praying and meditating. And to this day, that's how she begins her hour of her life. And um, she's so deeply grounded. Is she perfect? No. Does she make mistakes? Absolutely. Does she have her idiosyncrasies? Of course. But she is so incredibly grounded. Um. So in answering your question, it's hard. It is hard watching her youngest child. It's hard watching her child go through this. Um, when my father died, my, I remember my grandmother coming up to the casket and almost knocking him off the casket and saying, a son or daughter should never die before the parents. And that stuck with me when my dad died. And my mom and I have probably deeper conversations than most people have. And we talk about heaven. We talk about the life hereafter, not heaven. We talk about the life hereafter. We talk about our ability to communicate with those who have gone before us. We talk about how we'll communicate when we're no longer here. Um, in one aspect she has a tremendous amount of peace and in another aspect she feels completely helpless because she cannot fix this and she has to watch me deteriorate and she proof she has watched my body go through hell and and as a child my mom just loved to kiss her fingers and toes she thought all of our bodies were just so beautiful and to this day and to this day, she'll still play with my toes and my fingers and kiss them and tell me how beautiful I am. And I think as a mother, it's very hard for her to watch my body shut down and to shut down before her body. So it's a conundrum. It's a definite conundrum. But there is so much love there that it love is the answer. Love can withstand and manage anything love is love is the way love is the way that's the great teaching isn't it yeah love is the way that's the great teaching in the uh, bhagavad gita the great text of the hindu tradition that there are three great yogas um Bhakti yoga, which is the yoga of love, uh, jnana yoga, which is the yoga of wisdom, and karma yoga, which is the yoga of service in the world. And they represent the three great centers that we're all given. Um, our hearts, which is uh, bhakti, the yoga of love, uh, our minds, which is the yoga of wisdom, and our hands, which is the yoga of service. And this is what each of us is given. We're given our hearts, our heads, and our hands. And one finds that triadic 
truth in every great tradition because it's what we are physiologically organized to be. And um, and the Gita is very clear that the yoga of love, bhakti yoga, is the most certain path uh, because the yoga of, of wisdom, the Gita says it's so easy to get lost in wisdom. And the yoga of service, yes, but if the hands aren't guided by the heart and the mind toward, you know, skillful, skillful love, you know, then the, the service is misguided. And so um, does your mother live near you or far away? Two miles. Oh, what a blessing. <laughs> what a blessing. Yeah, I used to live in the, I, you know, I grew up here. I've been in about 22 countries and have lived in different parts of the, the world. And I had been living in the Northwest in Anacortes, not too far from you. And um, I reluctantly came back to St. Louis, but she was aging and none of the other siblings were here. And she really wanted to be in the town where we grew up, which is Webster Groves, which is a really special town. And so we both live here. And um, she lives in her own place. She still manages on her own. She's astounding. I live in my own place. I now have um, care every day, uh, friends and family who come in and are with me every single day. Um, and it's also, she's 38 years older than me because she had me later in life and she doesn't need everyday care and I do. So it's it's also astounding for her to watch me at certain times, the irony of how this all plays out. Does she still she's alive? Still she does not drive, but she's still in a book club. She plays bridge. She plays canasta. She's in a poetry group. She um, is in a faith sharing group. She's incredible. Absolutely incredible. So you mentioned that you and your mother talk about life after death or what happens with the soul and when in one of our personal conversations earlier, you talked about having experienced the other side. I think you said at least twice. Yeah. Um, what were your experiences of the other side? Beautiful, peaceful. Mm -hmm. There aren't words to describe. It felt like. Uh, it felt like I was floating and I didn't need oxygen, but I wasn't either underwater or in a space. It was just, it's very ethereal. Um, there was just so much love and joy and acceptance and peace. Uh, it was... I've not been afraid of death. When I was first diagnosed with cancer, I was terrified of death. Mm -hmm. Then I shifted out of that and I was terrified of pain. Now I'm realizing, can pain be managed? Because for me, throughout my whole diagnosis, quality of life has been the most important thing. I, I don't need quantity per se. It's always been quality. And I feel that way. And I'm a foodie, so I'd rather have amazing samplings of many things than a lot of one thing. Um, and I think that's partially why when you look at my friends, they are from such different walks of life because I love the variety. I love the perspectives. I love listening. I love assimilating. I love finding connections. But heaven was easy, or the afterlife. I don't know why I call it heaven, because I don't really believe in a heaven and a hell. And I don't believe in a devil. I think that's a man-made thing. Um, I think that's our own anxieties. I do believe in love. I truly believe love is the answer. Mm. I just, to everything and anything.
If you gave yourself love, actually, I truly believe to love thyself first is the key. And for me, it's through the divine light that I, I know I am loved. And when I look at what cancer has taught me, if I may for a moment, please it's taught, open. Yeah. It's taught me a lot of things. It's taught me how to be curious instead of afraid. It's taught, taught me how to be kind instead of angry. It's taught me how to be strong instead of having self-pity. It's taught me how to love myself rather than feel unworthy. It's taught me how to stand up for myself instead of waiting for someone else to do it. It's taught me how to release and let go of things that no longer serve me. Um, and it's reminded me how beautiful the world is and how amazing people can be. And it reminds me that whatever I give out, I get back tenfold. And um, part of the reason why I say that is, to some extent, I believe we have the ability to, I, I do believe we have the ability to shape the closing of our life as we know it, our last breath, the light going out, however you want to call it, the passing on. Um, and to your point earlier about the ability to sit in silence, I love silence. I love being in nature, even though it's not silent, because you can hear a cacophony of leaves and wind and birds and trees and animals it's as much as we want to say nature is silent it's a whole other world but i remember one time i was sitting and i thought wow and so many of my friends kept asking me what do you want what can i do what can i do and that's overwhelming and sometimes i ask people for things and it's just too much for them to do or they get bored of going grocery shopping for me or they don't really want to help with my laundry, even though that would be help, tremendously helpful for me. So in one of my quiet moments, I envisioned a ceiling and on it hanging down. I thought of, for some reason, butterflies and stars. And I thought of butterflies because I, I love butterflies beyond the metamorphosis of what a butterfly goes through. I believe in the butterfly effect. One small movement here can have an impact around the world. I have seen it. I believe it. So I've always loved butterflies more for that effect than for the metamorphosis. The reason why I love stars is because even in the darkness, you can see the stars. And so knowing that I can't hear what people will say about me after I leave, provided there's a service, and I hope there's a heck of a party because I want it to be a celebration of life. I thought, what if I asked people to, to send me just a few words about our friendship or something they remember or anything about us or me? And they put it in the form of a star or a butterfly. And so I sent that out about two weeks ago. And every day, it is astounding. I get a package. I get a card. I am getting some of the most amazing, fun, creative expressions. And that's what I wanted it to be. I wanted it, that person's expression of themselves. And one of my friends who claims he, he is a statistician, he's not, he doesn't just claim, he is a statistician. And he says he's not very artistic. He put together a star. And we had spent several years together. Um, he worked for the Cardinals and I was in another job, but we would go to events, the same events in town because I was pretty heavily involved in a lot of boards. And um, our, our way of getting out our frustration was to play, hit golf balls together. So we had this routine where we would hit golf balls and then we'd, we'd play for a hamburger or a martini or whatever we play silly games whoever came closest to the pin or whoever came closest to the flag 
so he put together the star and it was all of our favorite obscure places in St. Louis that we used to go together, including the golf range. And it was so perfectly put together by a man who claims he is not artistic. It is incredible. Mm. Um, I had another friend who went to Sedona who knows how much I, I love Sedona. And he brought back a heart-shaped red rock and um, hung it from fishing wire. And he said, it's not exactly an origami, but it's a heart. And it's a reflection of things that remind me of you. So I have been getting the most amazing, creative, heartfelt, playful. I have friends who have artists who have made art that is just astounding. I have friends who have no artistic ability who have made me the most pleasurable, joyful, simple things that you might expect from a second or third grader, but it came from them and from their heart and it's going to proudly be hung. And with this, I am receiving some of the most amazing notes that are just incredible. So I guess in a long roundabout way, I've learned a lot from cancer. I've learned so much from cancer. And I, I, I think the important thing is to be inclusive because cancer scares the heck out of people. Um, we don't know how to grieve very well in our society. And I will flat out ask my friends, how are you doing with this? How are you doing with watching my body as it degrades? And they've never had frank conversations. And we'll talk about grief. And I'm not afraid to go to the difficult places as long as people know it's in love. And I think it's wrong to go to a difficult place when there's anger and tension and resentment. That's such a disservice. I think the way to go to difficult places is to start out. For me, I say, I love you. I value you so much. I want to hear what you feel comfortable sharing with me. And if that means nothing, I'm okay with that. And if it means you, you have to take a couple of days or weeks to even come around to what it is that you can even say to me, I'm okay with that. But I just want them to know that it's from a place of love that they can share. And that's the most important part. So again, it comes back to love. Hmm. Do you believe in the power of prayer? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I believe some days I make it through moments because people are praying for me. Hmm. I have read research that showed in hospitals they had two groups of patients, both with very similar advanced disease. And in one room, they prayed for them. And in the other room, they didn't acknowledge them. And the room that was prayed for, they could actually demonstrate relief, measurable relief. So yes, I absolutely believe in the power of prayer. How about I yourself? That, I think that study is reported in one of Larry Dossie's books. On, yeah. On, yeah. Um, um, We've talked about your experience of the afterlife. Prayer seems to me to be a subset of our experiences of um, whatever we want to call subtle energies or the dimensions of the energetic universe that um, mainstream uh, material science doesn't know anything about or understand, and which I would regard as a mystery. Uh, but uh, a mystery about which I have some pretty strong feelings. Um, how do you understand or experience the subtle energies of the universe that are hypothetical from the point of uh, material science, but are very real in different ways for many of us? How do you, how do you situate prayer uh, with, uh, so for example, you know, I've it's been full catastrophe living in my household for some time ever since Rafi died. And so just 
and living with my wife's incredible grief, you know, even though I've worked with the grief of other people in the cancer help program for 37 years, I've never slept next to that much grief. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, and it, you know, I'm not an empath. I'm a compath, you know, I feel <laughs> compassion, but I don't internalize other people's grief usually, which is enables me to do the work. Right. But with Charles, you know, I, I am empathic. And so, having the experience of of sleeping next to that much grief was a huge teaching in my 80th year after doing this work for 37 actually closer to 40 years um so in order to live with that i needed to practice centering myself in my own heart energy which a friend suggested as a metaphor for it, um, so that I didn't simply become a satellite circling around this immense grief of this person I love so deeply. And so actually before we came on, Ken was watching me. I was bringing the light of the universe down into myself and into my heart and into my abdomen and down through my you know through the top of my head and just working with energetics so i give that as an example of someone who like you has spent a lot of time in the mystery of the invisible world without any judgment about just like uh, neither of us makes judgments about whether it's jewish christian buddhist yogic sufi whatever it is native american whatever uh, but we each have those of us who are interested in mystical and esoteric teachings. And I distinguish those because the mystery is just pure mystery. But esotericism is different theories of how the mysterious works, right? So what is your felt experience sense in which you situate both prayer and your belief in the world to come? Uh, in terms of the movement of energy in your own healing and your life? Mm. Wow, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I'm called to tell a little story. Um, after I finished my MBA, I went and worked for Ernst & Young. Um, I was very blessed to get a full ride scholarship for my MBA. And I went into a very um, regimented corporate job and for some reason I was drawn to this one secretary and I'd walk by her office all the time and just say, hi, how are you? And one day she said to me, do you understand your aura? Now, mind you, I've just studied management, statistics. I'm like, nowhere in this aura thing was I coming from. And I'm like, um, can you say a little bit more to me? And she said, when you walk down the hall, your colors light up. There is a glow around your body. And I'm like, um, really? <laughs> it was really out of context for me and not the place I would have expected someone to talk to me about energy. <laughs> so I remember that being one of the first times that I um, felt the dichotomy of how energy is everywhere all the time in available if you allow yourself to be tuned into it. Um, when I think back, my dad was a healer. When I would hurt, like I'd have leg pains, growing pains when I was a child, he would lay his hands on my legs and the pain would go away. And so no one ever talked about it. No one ever said, what was that? We just knew that if dad laid his hands on you, the pain would go away. So I think for much of my life, that energy was a given, but not discussed. 
And then later, as I learned of different modalities, um, Reiki, you know, massage, and, and allowed myself to experience those modalities and to feel energy flows, I started to realize it's not my imagination when I walk in a room and I can feel somebody's energy and I can feel, is that a, a warm person, a welcoming person, or is there a lot coming off of that person that is really challenging energy for me to be around? It took me years to understand that I had the ability to choose that or not. Sue, when you spoke of your father laying his hands on you and the children, the five children all knew pain would get better and that your father was a healer, um, and but it wasn't discussed. Um, do you think he knew that he was a healer? Uh, in other words, there are certainly traditions in which one doesn't speak of these things, right? Right. I don't know why we never spoke about it. But do you think he knew? Yes. You do? Okay. I mean, there are certainly, you know this really well, there are many traditions, Christian and otherwise, where the laying on of hands, you know, it's it fits perfectly into many traditions, right? Yep. Yeah. So do you think he had any sense of that? Absolutely. I do. Yeah. I I think my I think my father is giddily waiting for me. I feel his presence more and more. And he was one of my greatest champions. When I told my dad about this commissioner of school spirit thing. He literally said to me, great, we're going to do a campaign. We're going to do little cards. You're going to have a speech. You're going to have three key points and you're going to win. <laughs> like, Who are you and what are you talking about? <laughs> so my, my father was my champion <laughs> way before I understood any of what any of that means. Um, well, speaking of three key points. Um, imagine, and we've, we've covered this in different ways, but imagine that somebody with an advanced cancer is listening to us or watching us. Um, what are the, th and they are facing, either they've entered hospice or facing end of life. Uh, what are the three key things that you would want them to know? Mm -hmm loving themselves unconditionally is essential. Mm -hmm. I just find myself taking a deep breath when you say that, because in my own struggles, you know, with full catastrophe living, and you say that, and there's just this inhalation and exhalation of, ah, yes. So what are the other two? learning how to surrender mm -hmm. and let go. Mm -hmm. Surrender could mean surrendering to your expectations. Surrender could mean surrendering to a dream. Surrender could mean letting go to something that has upset you in your professional or personal life. Just surrendering and letting go mm -hmm. and that surrender also means trusting the process mm -hmm. and then i'd say probably living life not waiting to die mm -hmm. what matters most to you Focus on that and live life. Mm -hmm. Because we all know what the end's going to be. Mm -hmm. We don't know where we're going or what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. But don't worry about it. Don't worry about trying to control that. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about that part. Live. Mm -hmm. And and for me, that means being present. That means, it's interesting, 
like the other day, my mom and my friend Carla were here and I got four different packages and they're like, well, aren't you going to open the packages? And I said, no, not yet, because I need to be present. I need to have no distractions. These are thoughtful gifts that people put together for me. And even though they're not physically here, I, I open up a space in the table. I get out a notebook and I carefully unwrap. I study it. I let myself feel what I feel. I read the note. I wrap jot a little note that I want to say some back something to them about it. If I were not present, we just go through the motions. Mm-hmm. And so living, I guess, being present because otherwise life is just, I find so many of us just going through the motions instead of living it because I can guarantee whatever you're going through, it's going to end. That moment of joy, it's going to end. That utter debilitating pain is going to end. It will end. So live in that moment and let it go. But if you can learn how to have joy and if you can learn how to have fun, if you can learn how to be present, it's a whole other other experience. Let's go quiet for a minute again. Loving ourselves unconditionally. Surrendering. And living life, being present. Knowing that whatever is happening, that moment of joy, that pain, it will end. Loving ourselves unconditionally. Surrendering to the process and not waiting to die, but living. Loving, surrendering, living. Loving, surrendering, living. It reminds me of my favorite sutra in Pantajali's Yoga Sutras, which is the book that is the classic of the Hindu yoga tradition. I was just looking at it last night, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. The one I use is uh, translated by Swami Satchitananda, who was a great teacher for me. Um, And this sutra goes like this. The acceptance of our suffering as an aid to spiritual evolution the study of great wisdom traditions, and complete surrender to the divine force within each of us. These three things are yoga in practice. I'll say that again. The acceptance of our suffering as an aid to spiritual evolution, the study of great wisdom teachings, and complete surrender to the divine force within each of us. These three things are yoga in practice. It's the branch of yoga that's called Kriya Yoga. uh, And that's understood in different ways by different teachers. But this is the second book of the Yoga Sutras. And that teaching has been with me um, for um, 40 years. Whatever is happening to me, uh, I try, and it's not always easy. It hasn't been easy recently, but I try to accept it as an aid to my evolution. You can leave out the word spiritual. It doesn't matter. It gets in the way. But all of us are evolving one way or another, whether we're secular or spiritual or religious or whatever. So, accepting our suffering as opposed to trying to fend it off Um, and then seeking the great teachings, whether we call them spiritual, it doesn't matter, but what are the great teachings for us? Um, And then 
recognizing that there is this spark within each of us, whether you call it divine, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, in the Quaker tradition, like there is that of God in every human being. Um, so somehow what you said resonated for me. Yeah. What have we not spoken of? <laughs> what to say before we bring this beautiful conversation to a close I um, believe in community mm. always have I believe we have our own journeys and we were never meant to do them alone and so from my experience uh, learning when and how to let people in and learning when and how to be a part of a community is essential for mm -hmm. life. Um, Cause accepting means accepting help. Accepting means accepting something is the way that it is, even if it's not the way you want it to be. And that, I guess along with that goes receiving and so if, if you are in community, it's about giving, but it's also about receiving. And for me, again, the underlying tone is love. I, I remember when I used to go in for my, my protocols and my treatments, and I was always astounded when they'd ask the question, do you feel safe at home? And, and I could... I'd always pause because it would amaze me that there would be people saying, no, I don't. And how important it is to feel not just love, but safe. And so I encourage people that if they're in a situation where they don't feel safe, find a way to remove yourself and put yourself in a community where you do feel safe because they exist. Safety is a big part of our healing. Safety is a big part of our grieving because uh, it means we're, we feel vulnerable enough and safe enough to accept and receive and to give. So I would say continue to build community mm. and i have many communities i have cancer communities i have writing communities i have while i was still active i had cycling and hiking communities and what i found is when i went into those communities there was a part of me that i loved and therefore there was a commonality i had of with people in that community right off the bat that made it easy to connect because I think belonging is what we all thrive and strive towards. And of course, belonging starts with ourselves, but being part of a community also means you, you need to feel like you belong there. And if you don't feel you belong, don't force it. Keep looking till you find that community that you feel you belong. And it's going to shift. Excuse me. It's going to shift. Nothing stays the same. Mm. And that's where the letting go and surrendering comes into play. Because mm. it can be really hard when you get comfortable and you feel safe and something shifts. Mm. Much like what has happened with you all and Francis coming into your life. Mm -hmm. There was a, a routine, a safety, a community, a family that just got completely rocked. Yeah. So you've got to give it time. And I'm going to go back to love. Pile on that love for yourself, for your wife, for Francis. Mm your neighbors, mm. the dogs, that cats that Francis is going to meet. 
the coyotes, <laughs> everything. Absolutely. Let's go quiet again. Peace, peace. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Thank you. With all my heart, thank you. You know, Sue, you remember in the Cancer Help Program, part of what's so precious there is a deepening sense when we're together in the room at Pacific House or wherever we are, but particularly in the evenings uh, at Pacific House, eight participants and a few staff gathered together at the end of the living room on a circle of couches. Yeah. And and then often also in the one-on-one -on -one sessions or when you and I were at the chapel together, and there's this sense of, of awareness, of, of deep energetic presence together, you know. And what amazes me is that it's possible to experience that with you by Zoom, right? <laughs> it's amazing to me. And this is actually, you know, in when during uh, the the height of the COVID pandemic, when we couldn't do the cancer help program for nine months, yeah. um, and so we started the sanctuary retreats online. Um, yeah, and and discovered that it was possible. Yeah, and again in our healing circles uh, global retreats. Um, you know, where people gather with cancer or grief or loneliness or whatever it is. It's so amazing that this mediated experience uh, allows us still to be with people we love and care about in safety, as you said, in safety and in real, in deep exchange. So... I thank you, and I thank you for being in my life. Uh, I'm not saying goodbye to you yet. Uh, uh, when that time comes, we'll say goodbye. Uh, but who knows, you know, uh, who knows whether it'll be you or me, right? Right. We right. don't know that. You know, I'm in my 80th year. I, You know, uh, so we don't know who's passing over first, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, I hope I see you on the other side. Of course. Yeah. No question. <laughs> uh, we may well have been together on the other side before this. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is that if you pass over first, I would ask two things of you. One is, if you're able to be in touch with me, Please be in touch with me, because one of the great changes in my life has been, and it happened gradually over a period of years, my dad began to, began to come to me, you know. First of it was one, you know, many years ago, a professor of mine named uh, Harold Laswell at Yale, who uh, I swear he came to me at his death because... He came to me because I was probably among the very few of his students who he thought might make something of it, you know, because he was living in a very materialist paradigm. And then gradually over time, my friend Brendan O'Regan, who ran vice president for research at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, I keep his photograph at the head of my little bed in my study, and he's present for me. But gradually a growing tribe. My father, who was totally secular, came to tell me that the other side is real. He, he came to tell me that. And so I could tell you many more stories, but so I hope that you will join my dead if you, if you pass before I do. Amen. And, um, the other thing I would ask you to do is to um, watch over and pray for and support and guide our work, whether I've come over with you or not. If we can be part of the beloved community on the other side that is guiding the work, you know, 
Yes. My friend Francis Weller says that there's a high level of unemployment on the other side because we don't call on our dead yeah. for their wisdom and guidance, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, and this is a great teaching that we need to call on our dead and ask for their guidance, you know? Absolutely. They're there. They're present. They they want to support us. But if we don't, but spiritual protocol is that requires that we ask. Right. Yeah. That's a beautiful point. First of all, yes. If I go before you, I will definitely be communicating. And to your point, it is so important we ask. And I, those were my one manager in my life. Two words he said to me, just ask. And I'm like, just ask? And he said, just ask. That's all you have to do in anything in life. And someone may say yes, they may say no, or they may say not now, but just ask. Mm. And thank you for reminding me how powerful just asking can be. Isn't that beautiful? Maybe that's a fourth point. Unconditional love for yourself, right? Surrender, living, and just ask. Amen. And what I what stuck with me, uh, among many other things, from what you said, is if you have a friend who is nearing the end of this incarnation, don't forget to do their laundry. <laughs> do not forget that doing the laundry or picking up the prescription or driving somebody to the medical appointment or providing right. a meal, you know? I mean, don't think that sitting around, you know, talking about spiritual life is uh, what they want or need, or indeed that they want to talk about dying all the time. You know? Right, right. I mean, I, I have a friend up on Whitby, uh, Ann Kutcher, who runs uh, Enso House, which is a Zen hospice up there, and we did a spiritual biography together. And she works with dying all the time. And um, and uh, I said to her, do you ever get tired of talking about dying? She said, all the time. I don't want to talk about dying. <laughs> I said, neither do I. You know, so it's just like people get into this thing where they kind of think that it's so, so spiritual to talk to somebody about dying who happens to be dying. And it's not necessarily what they want to talk about or what you want to talk about. You know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful we've had this conversation, but I think we need to have more conversations and I think we ought to touch on some different topics and I know we'll have a lot of fun doing it. Well, who knows? Maybe we're going to do this again. You know, it's not out of the question at all. <laughs> well, I love you, Sue Mondello. And I, I just love you, Michael. To say that and, uh, Bless you, and um, you. let's stay in touch. Thank you for being <laughs> with us at Cancer Choices and the New School. Absolutely. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. 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 Here.